Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to this special webinar that we have organized on the occasion of National Oral Pathologist Day today on February 25th. This webinar will be conducted in association with ETSA Trinity Providers, Jaipur. Let me take this opportunity to welcome the organizing committee. First of all, Dr. Nilesh Parde, my very good friend, my batchmate from Government Dental College and Hospital Mumbai. He's an oral and maxillofacial pathologist, currently the director of ETSA Trinity Provider, Jaipur. Dr. Nilesh has been a committed academician, clinician, and a researcher with almost 20 years of experience. Over 117, 117 scientific publications, one textbook published, and he has filed two patents and one copyright. Dr. Nilesh is also editorial board member and reviewer for many national and international journals. He is the organizing chairman for this show. Next, I would like to welcome the organizing secretary, Dr. Pradakshina Vijay. She is a pool officer in the Department of Oral Pathology and Microbiology, KGMU, Lucknow. Next, I will welcome Dr. Priyanka Singh. She is an associate professor, Department of Oral Pathology and Microbiology, KGMU, Lucknow. So can we have Dr. Nilesh, Dr. Pradakshina and Dr. Priyanka on screen? Good evening, one and all, and thank you, Dr. Rajiv, so much. Uh, and really appreciate all your efforts and support for making possible this collaboration between ICPA and its certainty provider and providing us with this wonderful platform. So much thank you, Dr. Rajiv. I am really indebted to you. Uh, this organization, ETSA Trinity Provider, was established in the year 2016 by me and my wife, Stuti, having in mind three healthcare sectors in which she and me specialize, namely uh, mental health, nutrition and naturopathy, and dental speciality. After successful implementation and execution of the mental health and nutrition and naturopathy services, last year we began with our operations in the field of dentistry, with our main objective of spreading awareness among masses about oral and dental health and updation and dissemination of knowledge amongst professional colleagues. So this is our first public event in field of dentistry and being an oral pathologist, I couldn't have desired for a more better day than this, that is 25th February, which is celebrated as National Oral Pathologist Day on the occasion of birth anniversary of legendary oral pathologist Dr. Harnath Manishankar Dholakia, that is Dr. H.M. Dholakia. I am sure all the oral pathologists who have joined us this evening need no introduction of Dr. Dholakia, sir. Uh, but we also have many other colleagues who are not from oral pathology background. And for them, I would like to give a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Dholakia, sir. There's a small disclaimer that this information has been provided by our own Dr. Rajiv Desai from Nair Hospital and Dental College. And it has also been published in our specialty journal, uh, Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial uh, Pathology in December 2017. So I would just like to read out uh, Dr. Dolakia's introduction for all the audiences. Uh, Dr. Dolakia, sir, was born on 25th February 1926 at Mumbai. He did his LDSC in 1947 from Nair Hospital Dental College, Mumbai, which was then known as Medical College and Hospital. He also received his LDRSC in 1949 from Royal College of Surgery. Until 1959, there was no oral uh, post-graduation course available in the subject of oral pathology. It was only because of the efforts of Dr. Dolakia that in 1960, the first post-graduation course was started at Nair Hospital and Dental College in the subject of oral pathology. And Dr. Dholakia, sir, was the first postgraduate guide in all over India. During his early days at Nair Hospital and Dental College, this humble professor had no laboratory equipments or slides to teach the undergraduate students. However, due to his great passion for teaching, he borrowed microscope from the Department of General Pathology. With very limited technical resources, he developed nearly 7,000 teaching slides by collecting specimens, experimenting on biopsy and autopsic tissues and organs. His immense interest in photography was responsible for establishing the photography department at various institutes. He has been instrumental in planning the curriculum for oral pathology in many universities. He is also known for various classifications for which he has been called 
as master of classification another distinct honor he has that the oral pathologist must be aware that the radicular variety of double dense invaginitis was first reported and published by Dolakia sir and Dr. A.P. Bhatt from Nair Hospital and Dental College and it was also published in the Journal of Oral Surgery in 1975. Dr. Dolakia was the first president of Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists which was then known as Indian Academy of Oral Pathology. So keeping in mind his towering contribution in establishing and developing the subject of oral pathology, our association has bestowed his name for the Dr. H. M. Dolakia Oration Lecture as a mark of respect for him. Dr. Dolakia sir is undoubtedly one of the most known oral pathologists in India. All the oral pathologists from India will always be indebted to Dr. Dolakia sir as it is only because of his efforts and dedication that we could develop ourselves in this fascinating career. His achievements are truly an inspiration for all of us. And now I would request Dr. Pradakshana to please introduce our speaker for today evening, that is Dr. Shashi Mali. Uh, Dr. Pradakshana, hand over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Rajiv, sir, for giving us this opportunity and this platform. And thank you, ICPA. Education is not the learning of the facts, but training of the mind to think. With this note, we begin the event tonight by introducing the guest speaker of the webinar, Dr. Sashi Mauli, a dear friend and a surgeon par excellence. He completed his MCH from KGMU Lucknow, his MS General Surgery from Medical College Kolkata, West Bengal, and MBBS from Madras Medical College, Chennai. He has more than 50 publications in national and international journals and has authored a textbook of surgical manual for undergraduates. He has been awarded with many travel grants and ha has many research awards in his conferences. He is the active member of Association of Surgeons of India, Indian Association of Endocrine Surgery, and Association of Minimal Access Surgery. His areas of interest are benign and malignant breast disease, oncoplasty, reconstruction, endocrine tumors of thyroid, head and neck, parathyroid, adrenal, and minimal access surgeries. Presently, he is working as the associate consultant at Leelawati Hospital, Mumbai. With the permission from the chair, I request Dr. Sashi Mauli to begin with the lecture. Good evening, everyone. And I really thank the organizers, ICPO, Dr. Nilesh, and Dr. Rajiv for giving me this brilliant opportunity. And I find it really honored. Uh, to give a lecture on uh, Professor Dolakia's uh, uh, birth anniversary. So, I will be giving a lecture on uh, yeah, so oral manifestations of uh, endocrine disorders. So I have a disclaimer that the photos have been taken from uh, some of the Google sites and uh, scientific articles. Uh, there are no conflicts of uh, interest. Slide is stuck. Yeah, <clears throat> so, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, so what are these disorders and uh, how do I diagnose? What are the oral cavity findings in this particular disorders and what do I do? These are the, uh, this is the overview which you will be going through uh, for each disorder. And uh, <clears throat> so each part will contain an introduction, to clinical presentation and uh, significance uh, uh, or the implication for the healthcare provider. So 
basically coming to the generalized introduction for hormone the terminology has been coined by Ernst Starling in 1905 at Royal College of Physicians in London the meaning is to arouse or excite so these are released by various organs like pituitary thyroid parathyroid pancreas adrenal ovaries testes these are basically ductless organs which secrete their hormones directly into the bloodstream and they have a target organ as well as function so most of these disorders are uncommon except for the most common ones are diabetes mellitus and thyroid gland disorders now coming to the structure of tooth <clears throat> so we have this crown neck and root and which has enamel dentine pulp uh, the pulp chamber root canal there is a uh, apical foramen accessory canal and also it is surrounded in the root <coughs> by uh, periodontal ligament and cementum so we'll see a few manifestations manifestations of these uh, disorders which affect certain areas of the tooth so there is no per se there is no any uh, classification uh, which can be <coughs> uh, put forward but then pituitary disorders thyroid disorders parathyroid we go we go absolutely gland wise and then pituitary thyroid and parathyroid have either hypo or hyper whereas adrenal we have adhesions and cushions pancreatic disorders basically involves diabetes and vitamin d deficiency will be the last one so i go to the pituitary gland <clears throat> it is a master gland of the endocrine system which has anterior and posterior lobes the anterior lobe secrete growth hormone production acth thyroid stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone follicular stimulating and nsh the posterior lobes secrete vasopressin and oxytocin so i think this person needs no introduction so <clears throat> he had a growth hormone deficiency uh, due to which he was not selected in many of the football uh, uh, clubs whereas barcelona had selected him and so the growth hormone deficiency incidence per se is uh, ranges from 1 is to 4000 to 1 is to 10000 which is uh, one of the most common among the hypopituitary uh, syndromes and they are most susceptible to go to hypopituitary when growth hormone deficiency occurs in children it results in dwarfism and there is a low growth velocity whereas in adults the manifestations are not too many but then they have few uh, features like thin eyebrows lips mask like faces no specific dental changes per se in adults <laughs> so the oral cavity manifestations when it occurs uh, in the childhood there are bony changes which are small maxilla mandible called as micrognathia small arch small teeth and crown which is microdontia absence of tooth but very rarely there is delayed eruption of tooth delayed shedding of deciduous teeth as well as delayed development of the roots of permanent tooth and have which have small roots and they lack <coughs> development of third molar specifically the soft tissue changes include some fine wrinkles around the oral cavity and thin lips so this is one of the intraoral view which has multiple uh, retained deciduous teeth which are <laughs> lingually placed and some small dental arch with some dental caries the cranial facial abnormalities include immature facial appearance small facial dimensions that is <clears throat> in males increased posterior facial height short cranial base and total facial height retrognathic facial height whereas in females it is short cranial base and mandibular ramus height is reduced so the treatment per se includes growth hormone replacement which is done by the endocrinologists they are the experts and uh, the growth hormone replacement improves the facial dimensions as well as the ramus height when it given in right time so including the orthodontic procedures they have <clears throat> a role in alleviating these dental malic occlusions due the micrognathia when the growth hormone replacement is done well in time now coming to hyperpituitarism so hyperpituitarism involves <clears throat> hypersecretion of the hormones they may be mostly due to microadenomas or macroadenomas and they may be even mixed apart from a single hormone most common is prolactin the other second most common is growth hormone followed by acth and tsh
secretory hormones. So growth hormone secreting uh, comprising <coughs> tumors comprise of more than uh, around 20 percent of the pituitary tumors. If happens in childhood, <coughs> this is called as gigantism, and in adult it is acromegaly. There is also this gene mutation which has been found, gene S1. So the clinical symptoms uh, general include overall increased height, headache, vomiting due to the mass effect, visual disturbances, skin thickening, joint pain, deep voice because of the laryngeal nerves thickening. The signs include craniofacial changes like prognathism, <coughs> spade shaped hands, enlarged feet, carpal syndrome, Reynolds phenomena, and bony defects of the spine like upper dorsal kyphosis with the compensated lumbar hyperlordosis. They may have hypertension, cardiomyopathy, neuropathy, and sleep apnea. So, when the onset <coughs> is in childhood, a symmetrical uh, overgrowth is there with spinal deformities, carpal tunnel syndrome, Reynolds phenomena, which I discussed, the same thing. And when this uh, occurs in the adults, it results in acromegaly. They have an acquired progressive somatic disfigurement and the clinical signs include coarse facial features, spade shaped hands, deep voice, enlarged feet and the feet uh, are the soft tissue of these feet are swollen and there is also bone enlargement. So you can see here <coughs> the prognathic mandible with a lantern jaw pattern, a macrognathia is a large mandible, increased bonial angle teeth are proportional to the increase in the <coughs> skull. There is increased periosteal bone formation and enlarged nasal sinuses also. There is a hypersimentosis of uh, the teeth. The other heart tissue features are include condylar hyperplasia, posterior crossbite, anterior open bite, macrodontia and malocclusion of the tooth. That is class 3 angels is malocclusion and also diastema which is gaping in between the teeth. Other soft tissue features in the oral cavity include macroglossia with indentations of the lateral border of the tongue by the tooth, pedimatous lips and tongue, thickened skin that is because of the deposition of glycosamine of glycans, the mucopolysaccharides and there may be uh, salivary gland enlargement as well. Diagnosis is done by hormone levels. Treatment is basically exhibition of tumor if transvenital is possible, and that is the best choice. The orofacial abnormalities may be corrected by a corrective surgery, but after correcting the primer. So, implications in pituitary uh, issues general always prefer to treat the underlying cause before the dental procedure, if not an emergency. Growth hormone deficiency per se does not have much of an issue. Uh, respect, with respect to the growth hormone because when you supplement it you can uh, do a procedure of whatever dental uh, uh, procedure is to be done whereas growth hormone excess yes there are some implications which have to be kept in mind because of, after the excision of the tumor these patients may require some thyroxine supplementation and few may require even steroids lifelong so the risk of infection is pretty high and perioperative injectable steroids should be administered for these patients who are on uh, steroid supplements. Coming to thyroid gland, so we have hypothyroidism first, <coughs> which is a uh, decrease in the thyroid hormone levels or its action uh, because of primary or it may be central or it may be due to defect in the T3, T4 T3 conversion or the resistance to thyroid hormone at tissue level. The prevalence increases with age. Females are uh, more involved than males. The prevalence is 0.6 to uh, 12 per thousand in females and 1.3 to 4 uh, per thousand in males. Clinical features of this hypothyroidism include weight gain, fatigue, lethargy, cold intolerance, dry skin, body aches, hoarseness, constipation, infertility, and erosion. The signs may have goiter, alopecia, coarse hair, mixed edema delayed reflexes, cerebellar ataxia, bradycardia, cardiac failure, angina, pericardial effusion and coronary artery disease. 
the respiratory uh, or, organs <coughs> may have bradypnea, respiratory muscle weakness, failure with insignificant stoma, and uh, central nervous system depression and psychosis may happen. Now, coming to the face and oral cavity clinical features, which are more important, per se, uh, adults with hypothyroidism do not have much of uh, clinical features, but then when this happens in neonates or children, this results in cretinism, which have soft tissue changes such as enlarged salivary glands, compromised periodontal health, micrognathia, a comparative macroglossia with glossitis, thick lips due to glycosaminic glycans deposition, not just deposition, but also there is reduced <coughs> uh, clearance of this uh, mucopolysaccharides, that's why there is a deposition, dysgeusia, mouth breathing, and delayed wound healing. And heart tissue changes may be like <laughs> anterior open bite, enamel hypoplasia in both deciduous as well as permanent root, delayed tooth eruption, altered tooth morphology, craniofacial development uh, is severely affected, the delayed bone absorption and dissociation of the ramus growth is, is present, and there is insufficient space for the eruption of the tooth, and which may result in infraction of this mandibular tooth, especially second molar. So this is the delayed eruption of teeth in hypothyroidism and on the right side you can see the microglossia and glossitis. These are anterior open bite, caries uh, and enamel hypoplasia. So diagnosis is basically by thyroid hormone uh, levels, TSH and 3 4 and treatment is referred to an endocrinologist with thyroxine supplementation and they are used. Hypothyroidism. <coughs> There is increase in thyroid hormone levels for adaption or transaction, excess TSS receptor stimulation, autonomous thyroid hormone secretion from the gland per se, a destruction of the follicles of the thyroid gland, which releases the preformed hormone or extra thyroid source of thyroid hormone. These all result in thyroid hormone levels increase or its action is increased. So even this, the instance uh, is more common in females than males. The overall prevalence rate is 1.2. Females are more affected than males. Symptoms, yes, this is for my uh, MBBS uh, uh, <coughs> colleagues and juniors who are uh, who want to remember it. It's a very easy way to remember, except for a weight loss. You will have almost all the things while going attending the practical exam. So remember that. Heat intolerance, sweating, double vision, palpitation, muscle weakness, nervousness, restlessness, insomnia, diarrhea, and irregular menstrual cycle. So, <clears throat> most of the symptoms will be present on the day of your practical exam. So, it's very easy to remember. There are signs you may have goiter, diaphoresis, hypothermia, tremors. The tremors are seen on fingers and the uh, tip of the tongue. Eye signs may be present, exothermos, hemosis, blood retraction, and the internal ophthalmoplegia. The main signs such as long graphic of us, stalwart, darling, told, I won't go into the details. Cardiac <coughs> vascular uh, manifestations, patients may have tachycardia, arrhythmia, sacral fibrillation, cardiac failure and angina. They may have dermal thickening, non-fitting edema, fine, uh, so, fine hair, soft nails, palma edema, warm moist skin. So coming to the oral cavity manifestations, the heart tissue changes <coughs> are increased susceptibility to caries. These patients have a very high susceptibility to caries, periodontal disease, premature exfoliation of the deciduous tooth and accelerated tooth corruption of the permanent tooth, increased resorption of the alveolar bone because of the hyperthyroid state per se, which leads to maxillary and mandibular osteoporosis because of the high bone turnover. Soft tissue changes may include enlargement of the extraglandular thyroid tissue, lateral and posterior part of the tongue, burning mouth syndrome. The diagnosis again is by thyroid hormone levels, PSH and QT4. Treatment is to treat the etiology. It is primary. From the uh, thyroid, it has to be controlled by drugs. And then if it is a graves or an autonomous mo uh, functioning module, the surgery may be required. Implications in thyroid uh, disorders. General implications are surgery should always be postponed if not an emergency and performed when the patient is with thyroid. 
In case of an emergency, always an endocrinologist should be available and has to be solved. Hypothyroidism has a delayed one healing issues, so the patients have to be rendered hypothyroid because of performing any surgery. And hypothyroid patients may have a risk of bleeding as well as thyroid storm. So it has to be very much controlled. The use of powder iodine in such recent dental procedures or any surgeries in these patients was a very big debatable topic few years back. <coughs> like along with the IV contrast, which are iodinated IV contrast, were debated few years back. But now there is a enough evidence to say that you can still use powder iodine as well as iodinated contrast agents for a CT scan before performing any surgery. Thyroid surgery. Thanks. Now coming to parathyroid gland. <coughs> so we'll discuss hypoparathyroid gland first, which is low PTS, low calcium and the high phosphorus levels. It is maybe primary or secondary, primary is idiopathic or autoimmune, secondary. The most common cause of hypoparathyroid gland is iatrogen, that is post thyroid gland. Ray. It may range from 2 to 40 percent in temporary and permanent may range from 0 to 10 percent over studies. There is another entity called as pseudo hypoparathyroidism where the parathyroid levels are normal or high. In fact, there is a the calcium levels are low and there is a high cholesterol levels. This is because of the kidney fails to respond to PTH. The clinical features of hypoparathyroidism include certain level numbness, paresthesia, or distal extremities, fingers and toes, muscle pain, spasm or tetanus, <coughs> abdominal muscle pain, cramping, laryngospasm or bronchospasm, and even seizures. Signs may include rustic sign or drosal sign, and the skin may have some same changes like alopecia, loss of axillary and pubic hair, coarse body hair, scaling of skin, deformities of the nail. So the clinical features of pseudo uh, hypoparathyroidism include a characteristic round faces, short stature, obesity, epoptic soft, soft tissue ossifications, cataracts, and short hands and feet, irregular shortening of the small tubular bones, which are very characteristic in the small third and fourth finger and toes. Very pathognomonic of this uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And then I have even memory loss and mental deficiency. The heart tissue changes into a hypoplastic enamel, which have dull white teeth, the soft, which are soft and palpation, uh, delayed eruption, multiple unerected teeth, small crown microvangia, hypervangia, and some tumor specifically. They have short roots with blunt end, <coughs> malformed roots, and close of the teeth, pulp stones, maxilla, short and wide jaws. They have high ash palate and caries. What the <coughs> Uh, the soft tissue changes may be facial muscle bleaching, sarcomeral numbness, paresthesia, or the tongue and lips, candidates for oral mucosa. So, the radiograph shows there is widened root canal, poorly calcified dentine with multiple resorptions and cementum in the cementum. Large pulp chambers occluded by calcified deposits, which are called as dental pulp calcifications. They also have thickened thickening of the laminar pleura. Uh, investigations to diagnose a uh, uh, hypoparathyroidism, uh, we need a battery of tests, all our biochemical, parathyroid, hormone levels, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D levels, albumin, creatinine. And then once the etiology is found, it has to be treated. Coming to hyperparathyroidism, which is of more uh, interesting, when it comes to oral cavity uh, uh, <coughs> lesions or features, hyperparathyroidism is inappropriate PTH levels with high calcium and uh, low phosphorus. Of course, there also exists a normal calcium variant or a normal hormonal variant, which is uh, not to be discussed now and out of context. Again, this is more common in females and increases with the age. Etiology may be primary, which uh, comprises mostly of adenoma in uh, 70 to 85 percent of the cases, hypoplasia in 10 to 15 percent, and uh, malignancy that is parathyroid carcinoma less than 1 percent. May be secondary or tertiary causes of hyperparathyroidism. And these are associated with few syndromes like men 1 to A, hyperparathyroid jaw tumor, familial uh, isolated hyperparathyroidism, or neonatal hyperparathyroidism. 
50% of these may be asymptomatic. Our clinical features include bones, stones, groans, bones, fatigue overtones, which I will not be going into details. Signs include osteoporosis, osteomalacia, pathological fractures, renal stones, pancreatitis, maybe acute or chronic, and our pancreatic calcifications, cognitive dysfunction, cardiovascular uh, uh, system may be involved with hypertension, left ventricular heart. Hypertrophy, cardiomyopathy, uh, vascular calcifications, and to oral cavity manifestations. Heart tissue changes include developmental defects in the neonate special, jaw expansion, alteration in the dental corruption, mobile or drifting of the teeth, narrow dental pulp, malocclusion due to drifting, may be one of the first signs which is possible. So, if it is present, the dentist has to very much uh, have a very high suspicion. Or this hyperthyroidism. Then I have jaw pain, loss of uh, laminar dura or the roots, generalized demineralization, the particle boundaries of the, of the inferior border of the mandibular canal and the maxillary senses, loss of normal trabecular pattern. There is a ground glass appearance, which means all of the bone looks like same. And uh, there is a decreased density of jaws per se. Now this hyperparathyroid jaw tumor may have fibrous tumor of the jaw, which has a 15% chance of increased chance of having the parathyroid uh, carcinoma rather than just an adenoma. This is the OPG of hyperparathyroidism, which uh, can be seen, and the skull radiograph on the right side, which shows a characteristic loss of corticomedullary differentiation, cort uh, loss of uh, uh, it shows a very uh, nice osteoporosis with a salt and pepper appearance of the skull. The I don't know if it is appreciated or not. The vascular markings are very well uh, seen if it is enlarged. And then you can see the uh, generalized osteoporosis of the uh, mandible as well as the whole of the skull. So what about brown tumors? Yeah, I did not get a uh, X-ray of a brown tumor, but yes, these are not true tumors. They most commonly occur in the face facial bone, but they may occur even elsewhere. And maybe single or multiple erosive bone lesions with rapid osteolysis, very trabecular fibrosis. That is hemosiderin deposition. That is the uh, reason why it's called as brown. Is variable defined margins. <coughs> now the soft tissue changes may have. Intraoral or extraoral soft tissue swelling, soft tissue calcifications, etc. These uh, again come into the secondary uh, hyperparathyroid with compass in the chronic pulmonary failure. Then I have maxillary hyperplasia, hyperostosis cranialis, enlargement of the cranial bones, bizarre facial deformity, dental malocclusion, and also even the long bones, which are very pathognomonic. There's something called as Sagalikar syndrome, which occurs due to improper medical therapy in uh, children which becomes irreversible and the bony changes are irreversible basically <clears throat> which happens in a chronic kidney disease where they have an ugly appearance, short stature, malocclusion with uh, teeth and dental abnormalities, knee and scapular deformities, hearing abnormalities and neurological and psychological problems. Now, diagnosis again includes the battery of this, which is essentially biochemical, and of course, uh, to see the end organ damage. For skeletal system, basically, it's a bone mineral density or a DEXA scan, which includes three sites that is, distal uh, forearm, neck of femur, and lumbar vertebra. Now, the treatment uh, per se for a primary hyperparathyroidism or a secondary hyperparathyroidism depends. Usually, it is surgical. Of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, maybe focused on bilateral neck exclusion. Medical management depends uh, on patient to patient, especially patients coming with a hypercalcemic crisis. And those who are, are not fit for surgery, they may undergo something called as ablation with either ethanol or radiofrequency. Now, implications is very important for uh, dentists because these are mostly osteoporotic bones and they have impaired healing. Periapical radiolucency may be mistaken for endo, uh, endodontic origin, and then the dentist may open up the root canal, which has to be avoided. <coughs> a differential diagnosis for brown tumors 
uh, is aneurysm of bone cyst, Janssen tumor, hyperparathyroidism, jaw tumor, uh, in which case uh, there is fibrous tumor. And there is recreation of these brown tumors after the surgery for primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, but if these still persist after long term, then we may have to undergo surgical excision. And the vitamin D deficiency, which is also almost like closely related to the uh, hyperparathyroidism, but uh, uh, it's because of the osteoporosis basically. Uh, there is a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> Among various studies in India, it ranges from 20 to uh, 25 to 95 percent in uh, India. Uh, ETLG may be nutrition or uh, type 1, type 3 vitamin D deficiency and uh, resistant tickets. So basically, there is a bone mineralization defect when uh, occurs in children, that is before the epiphyseal closure causes rickets, and in adults, after the epiphyseal closure, there is osteomation. There may be two types either calcipenic rickets or phosphopenic rickets. That is, calcipenic rickets basically uh, means that the calcium is levels are low. The phosphopenic is phosphate levels are low. So, vitamin D deficiency or resistance can cause calcipenic uh, rickets. <laughs> the causes are listed down. And then, phosphopenic is basically because of the renal tubular phosphate loss, which leads to reduced uh, phosphate levels, and which are uh, which also have some genetic uh, mutations, X linked and the autosomal uh, dominant traits. This may be also having. Uh, the phosphopenic rickets may be also because of renal pancreas and dietary phosphodiabetes, which is a very rare cause. So clinical features, general clinical features include grain of babies, rickety rickety rosary, that is pigeon chest, Harrison groove, costochrome junction, widening, valgus varus deformities of the knee joint, kyphosis, growth retardation, soft bones, bone pain, any uh, fractures, pathological fractures. Tingling, numbness, paresthesia, tetany, convulsions, hydrocephalus, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, cardiomyopathy. <coughs> Coming to oral cavity manifestations, when I have gingivitis, poor, poor oral hygiene, these are the soft tissue, and rest are all hard tissue uh, manifestation that is caries, poor bone mineralization, hypoplasia of the enamel, supragingival mineral deposits, malocclusion, dental arch anomalies. Irregular teeth position, hypocalcification of permanent teeth, widening, <laughs> widened elongated pulp chambers, and recurrent trauma may happen. This is one of the uh, pictures of enamel hypoplasia on the left side. Uh, on the right side, you can see the hypocalcification of the permanent molar secondary to rickets. This is vitamin D uh, resistant rickets, which shows that uh, on the left side, widening. Widened elongated pulp chambers, uh, which may require some endodontic therapy, and uh, <coughs> this also uh, increases the exposure to uh, pulp trauma. This is hypophosphatasia, which uh, uh, shows the premature loss of the anterior mandibular dentition, specifically the incisors, and premature loss of decidual teeth uh, and lack of inflammatory response. Right, sir. So coming to vitamin D uh, deficiency summary, uh, nutritional type 1, type 2, type 1 is again divided into 1 A, 1 B, which I am not going to details, and vitamin D uh, <coughs> resistant effects. So basically uh, these are the uh, parameters where uh, calcium, phosphorus, salvin, phosphate, parathyroid hormone levels, vitamin D levels have been checked. And in the nutritional variant, uh, the supplementation of uh, uh, vitamin D is for it depends on from weeks to months whereas in type 1 vitamin d deficiency it is lifelong but the uh, dosage is less than that of the type 2 vitamin d deficiency both vitamin d as well as calcitriol and uh, what type 2 vitamin d deficiency and uh, vitamin d resistant rickets they need lifelong with uh, high vitamin d doses per day almost with the calcitriol 1 to 2 microgram per day lifelong So this is the effect where uh, you can see on the right side that <coughs> vitamin D uh, acts as a uh, autop has an autophagic activity and then uh, it also uh, inhibits the bacterial invasion and then 
making the teeth to be less susceptible for any infection. Where on the left side you can see uh, that vitamin D deficiency increases the <coughs> uh, metabolic disturbance, and then there is a breach in the surgical membrane, biomaterial, and invasion of the bacteria causes more uh, infections. So implications basically is that there is <coughs> teeth uh, have enamel dentin and cementum which uh, require this uh, mineralization and that goes parallel uh, in hand with uh, bone mineralization. If it is not treated in the early stages then uh, along with the long bones and other bones even teeth will uh, develop a lot of uh, malformations and deformities. Rectic tooth uh, may be present with defective uh, mineralization. These patients are associated with uh, periodontitis. Um, and important for tooth movement in the orthodontic uh, procedures where uh, the bone resorption at the pressure sites is due to the osteoclast and bone formation at the tension site where the osteoclast is being maintained. So this requires vitamin D. Now coming to adrenal and rush through, uh, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease uh, is very rare due to deficiency in the cortisol and aldosterone uh, levels. Uh, the causes may be primary or secondary. Clinical features, these patients are usually fall, land up in the emergency. Nausea, vomiting, the pain, pain, anorexia, so weight loss, and headache, muscle weakness, myalgia, sympathy, <coughs> diarrhea, depression. And they have a very high salt rate because of loss of salts. They have uh, tachycardia, dehydration, hypertension. They are aesthetic and even look. Uh, they have a cutaneous hyperpigmentation, which I will be uh, discussing in the normal material hyperpigmentation. They have infertility and ovarian insufficiency. So, this is the precursor uh, hyperpigmentation. They have a bronzing effect. That is because of the darkening of orofacial skin, vermilion blood, and the sun exposed areas. <coughs> so, this is because of the increased basic use and brutal epicotin. Uh, there is a pigmentation and histologically there is increased melanin in the basal layer without increasing in the melanin size number. And association with squamosal carcinoma, it is uh, it has a very less uh, <coughs> mechanism, clear, unclear mechanism. The differentials may be melanotic macule, smoking, drug induced, pure sugar syndrome or other familial hematomic syndrome. Capillary spots are one of the differential diagnosis spots, which can be uh, made out easily. They, are, they appear as a co coffee with milk appearance. Classically appear in the uh, neurofibromatous and others are mechanalpate and polycystic fibrous dysplasia. So, diagnosis is basically clinical high suspicion, long standing history of any steroid intake with a sudden withdrawal. <coughs> you can see with the electrolytes, uh, electrolyte levels, cortisol levels, and stimulated cortisol levels to be done. Treatment basically general and specific, general because hydration and electrolyte balance treatment and specific towards directly towards the etiology. And these patients will require steroids. So, implications are very mild patients diagnosing <coughs> adrenal insufficiency is difficult. Prompt referral should be made to an endocrinologist. It is absolutely important to refer any other entry procedures till a proper evaluation and management has been done. Because these patients, since they have a, a steroid, and they require steroid doses, so it is very important for any dentist, uh, dentist to uh, not intervene until unless it's an emergency. Even if it is an emergency, we'll have to consult an endocrinologist, treat it first, and then only take care of the dental part. <laughs> Coming to Cushing syndrome. Uh, so the etiology may be uh, ACTH dependent or ACTH independent. There is another variant called as pseudo cushions, which is basically involves uh, pregnancy, obesity, etc. Symptoms <coughs> I'll not go into detail. Uh, they have the classic uh, clinical features are facial plethora, with cutaneous stare, which is more than one centimeter, which are purple violaceous. These people have uh, easy bruisability, central obesity, buffalo hump, acne, skin thickening. Now, the oral manifestations in children, they include skeletal and dentition uh, is retarded. The premature T 
teeth eruption may be present, partial loss of lamina dura, reduced bone density, there are osteoporosis or the high steroid levels in the blood. They may have pathological fractures as well. The management is from diagnosis of uh, pushings and then followed by treating the tibialogy. Coming to diabetes mellitus, this is the most common uh, endocrine uh, disorder which we find. Uh, WHO has declared it as a global pandemic. There are two types, basically type 1, type 2. Also, there is type 3 nowadays, which are not included in this. And uh, <coughs> these patients have a periodontal disease, which is sixth most common manifestation or the complication in diabetes mellitus. So, I will directly go to the oral manifestations of the soft tissue, gingivitis, salivary gland dysfunction. Then I have taste dysfunction, fungal bacterial infection, geographic tongue, benign migratory, glossitis, fissure tongue, traumatic ulcers, lichen planus, lichenoid reaction, angular chelitis, delayed wound healing, which is very important in neurosensory disorders over time. So, this is the most common one. <laughs> Periodontitis, which is uh, sixth most common uh, manifestation or complication of the diabetes, which occurs due to chronic inflammation uh, affecting the gingiva, and there is uh, bacteria which harbors in this place. Uh, this occurs almost 60 percent in uh, diabetes as compared to non diabetes, which is 39 percent. If failed to remove this plaque, there, there occurs a plaque in this, and if uh, this plaque is not removed, the toxins uh, accumulate there and it forms a vicious cycle and more and more toxins get accumulated which leads to more and more bacteria uh, getting uh, affecting the periodontal tissue. So there is a pocket formed which gets deeper and then involves the bone which destroys the bone. There are various theories uh, for this which is uh, either advanced, it's called, <coughs> uh, advanced glycation that is the HbA1c is increased and uh, this, this is because of the prolonged hyperglycemia. Uh, changes in the collagen state which increase collagen activity and reduction in the collagen synthesis. So there is uh, this periodontitis. Uh, also altered immune function with immune uh, in <coughs> impaired uh, polymorphonucleus uh, leukocytes and uh, phagocytes. There is compromised uh, immune healing because of this which may again um, uh, result in periodontitis and smoking is an additional factor which increases this risk. Now treatment, coming to the treatment, just breaking this vicious cycle is very important where it has been found in many studies that you break periodontitis and the glycemic, <coughs> glycemic control is achieved. Achieve glycemic control, periodontitis is improved. So it's a uh, uh, Hand hand situation where you have to break the cycle and then the patient will improve. Salivary and taste dysfunction may be there because of uh, reduced saliva and uh, zero stomia. The salivary flow rate per se is reduced, they have dry mouth. Polydipsia and polyuria is one of the results because of this. And then they may have uh, periodontal infection again due to <coughs> reduced uh, saliva. They may have cyanosis, altered taste sensation, and which basically occurs in poorly controlled diabetic patients. And uh, yes, of course, there is a high taste threshold which leads to again poor and poor diabetic control. Oral infections may be fungal or bacterial, fungal may be primary, secondary. Uh, they most commonly occur uh, with smoking, dentures, and poor glycemic control. It may be either acute pseudomembranous and erythematous, which is called as oral thrush, or chronic, which is called as candidial leukoplakia, or danger induced hematitis, which is which includes uh, uh, angular colitis and medium bombard glossitis. Bacterial may be due to streptococcus, which is the most common. Subangular space is involved most commonly than the buccal space, which may also include neck spaces if the <coughs> sugars are not controlled. Uh, other mucosal, oral mucosal diseases may be like oral uh, lichen planus, uh, more with type 1 diabetes, aphthous ulcers, atrophic erosive uh, lesions, there may be neurosensory uh, issues like uh, burning mouth syndrome, which is very important, and uh, diabetic neuropathy root nerve damage. So, to conclude, <coughs> endocrine disorders per se are rare, except for diabetes and uh, thyroid. Clinical suspicion should be very high. 
in diagnosing these patients with a proper history and examination. Knowledge is important for the same. They have to be referred to an endocrinologist for a prompt treatment and dental procedures have to be well planned. If not an emergency, they always have to be corrected and then planned for a dental surgery. So, <clears throat> a doctor who cannot uh, take good history, of course, I will add one more, and examination, and a patient who the, cannot give the proper history are in danger of giving and receiving back pain. So, today we have learned, I guess, a uh, <clears throat> lot of history and examination points which you have to keep in mind that yes, these are the features if present, we have to evaluate and treat it accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shashi Moli. That was an exhaustive presentation. You covered almost everything. All the endocrinal uh, disorders. I have a few questions related to dentistry. Uh, we see a lot of implant failure patients. Implants have been, dental implants have been put. Everything was fine. Suddenly, after some time, we see that the implants are coming out for no reason. So, should we suspect vitamin D deficiency? And if, if so, then should we be doing vitamin D uh, levels assessment? as a routine in every case or should be selected to some cases based on the history that we get? Yes, it's a very nice question. Actually saying there is uh, a lot of uh, high prevalence of uh, vitamin D deficiency in our Indian subcontinent. So uh, this may be due to various reasons. As I said that uh, among studies it almost ranges from 20 to 95 percent. And yes, uh, that's a good question if we have to do a vitamin D, uh, vitamin D levels routinely or not. See, it depends on place where you live. Yes, ideally, if uh, according to the protocol, I would say you have to do a 25 adults vitamin D and correct it. In spite of that, these patients will need not only vitamin D uh, supplements, also calcium supplements. So, to counter the uh, osteoporosis and the underlying bone issues, mineralization problems. Now, uh, coming to say government setup or in patients who are poor who cannot afford to do this, I would say that a cost effectiveness of rather doing a vitamin D versus giving vitamin D uh, supplements is the best. But then the flip side of it is yes, many people may ask that what about the toxicosis? So, I have never found toxicosis of vitamin D till date. Even in normal uh, uh, vitamin D levels, if I had supplemented, this was one of the studies which I have conducted. So, uh, the range at least went till only 60 or 65 even in normal vitamin D levels. The More than 100 is taken as toxic levels. So, you can very well give and then, yes, uh, do the procedure. It will maybe uh, delay the procedure by 6 to 8 weeks because of vitamin D, uh, vitamin D supplement. But otherwise, if it is an emergency, yes, do the procedure and keep them on supplements. Okay, so in short, if you find if you are going for an extensive implant surgery, better supplement him with vitamin D and calcium. Yes. The chances of toxicity are very, very minimal. And yeah. uh, wait for the levels to rise and plan it after six to eight weeks. Supplementing the patient. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the uh, second is we see a lot of uh, periodontal patients in periodontitis. Everything is good. Hygiene is good. He's a well maintainer. He keeps going to the clinic. And suddenly one day he comes and he, he you know, after some years he comes and he shows that his teeth are becoming loose. And we take OPG and we see that there is bone loss. Oral hygiene is still good. So in that case, we, we, we don't come to know the cause. As you showed a slide of uh, dysbiosis, etc. And if we have to suspect that one endocrinal disorder, which investigation should I advice for this patient? Uh, actually, saying it's a very difficult question, in fact, because, uh, <clears throat> see, uh, I would suspect two things. If it is, uh, if the patient is a female and elderly, I can suspect both uh, vitamin D deficiency as well as hyperparathyroidism. Now, hyperparathyroidism, the secondary, one of the secondary causes is again vitamin D deficiency. So, under the broad classification of hyperparathyroidism, yes, I would say, I suspect the hyperparathyroidism. So, always a primary hyperparathyroidism is uh, <coughs> diagnosed after only out the secondary causes. So, in the secondary causes, you will definitely get, you will have to rule out CKD as well as vitamin D deficiency. Okay. So, 
that is the reason why I said that there are panel of tests for diagnosing the hyperparathyroidism. Okay. So I would still take it as a hyperparathyroidism and rule out all those to be on a safe side. So my first suspect why? should be hyperparathyroidism. Why? Because <laughs> this goes unnoticed, especially like 50% of the cases do not manifest anything. I would say I have seen many other people. That's the reason why there is a variant called as normal calcinic hyperparathyroidism where the calcium levels are normal but their hyper, uh, the parathyroid uh, hormone levels are high and they have some other, other end organ damage and again we will have to take up them for the surgery. Similarly, there is another variant which is called as normal hormonal variant where the hormone levels are normal, parathyroid hormone levels but the calcium levels are high. So again, they have a set of criteria. If they fall into that criteria, they have to undergo surgery. It's a so very now, part. So yeah, what you what you told there are three variant varieties now. Calcium levels are normal, PTH levels are wrong. Second, PTH levels are um, normal, calcium levels are wrong, and third is where both of them are wrong. Both of them so are wrong. Yeah. We need to identify right. which one is wrong. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That was that was great. Something really we can we should apply. And the third thing. Uh, we see a lot of discomitic gingivitis cases, which are due to autoimmune immunogenetic disorders, pemphigus, pemphigoid, and more commonly oral lichen planus, and uh, which we find often in middle-aged ladies in the perimenopausal phase. And uh, that's an you know immunogenetic disorder. Is it because of the estrogen level uh, fluctuation that has triggered the genetic locus? Uh, I, I may not be. Uh very convincing with that because uh, there are other factors per se in our Indian population which would probably uh, be held responsible or more predisposing than just an estrogen. Okay. Because all these elderly people, yes, definitely they do uh, have uh, low levels of estrogen. But then not most of them have immunogenic uh, reactions or anything. So I would say that there is something else. Uh, probably a rheumatologist would be more uh, uh, experienced in answering this uh, rather than just an estrogen. So I would say no for an estrogen. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, we see a lot of kids with the delayed eruption in teeth, over retained deciduous teeth as well as delayed eruption of permanent teeth. So a lot of people are clueless. They don't know which investigation to take. They have the x-rays, but they don't. they are not able to pinpoint what is which hormonal uh, should be so what should be the what is the first suspect uh, a practicing dentist should get in his mind yeah again coming to the same thing it is uh, uh, in kids it has to be a vitamin d deficiency because they are nutritionally depleted most of the uh, kids in our uh, country they have this issue where uh, they are not having the proper nutrition so yeah apart from that yes definitely we'll have to see the other clinical features which i have said like general clinical features which I have added, that's the reason, so that they know that yes, this, this particular general uh, clinical feature is present. So I may have to think of this particular uh, investigation. So <clears throat> if the patient, if the kid comes with something like uh, features of cretinism, then there is no point in doing just a vitamin D. So if, they, if you have a clinical suspicion, yes, you will know that, okay, five-year-old kid or six-year-old kid is coming, but he is not mentally developed as a five-year or six-year-old kid. Then you will have okay. So this is he is having some issues. Growth, the growth is not uh, as good as a five year or six year old. You have this dental manifestations as well, with other features of uh, clinical hypothyroidism. So yes, you have to go for clinical hypothyroidism work. But otherwise, normal kid, just only with this oral issues, I would say that it is most commonly due to vitamin D nutrition uh, deficiency. Okay. So the first suspect is vitamin D deficiency vitamin D. and if you want to suspect any endocrinal disorder will, then you better take the comp make a comprehensive analysis Compress. and then proceed. Right. Okay. right. Great, great, great. So let me take some of the questions sent by the audience. Uh, I think you have answered this question. Does hypo hypothyroid patient have any oral manifestations and is it okay to proceed yeah. with dental care for patients who are on thyroxine tablets regularly? And if yes, so, yeah. Any yeah, yes, definitely they can undergo uh, any procedure once they are euthyroid. They won't have issues with uh, thyroid uh, uh, problems. 
once they are euthanized then nothing much to worry about so apart from that if they are having any other comorbidities like diabetes or any other thing okay apart from hypothyroid then you have to consider uh, risk of infection etc uh is there any association between oral pigmentation and uh, pcos pcos for uh, the audience it is polycystic ovary syndrome is your so is there any relation between them yeah. this is one of the audience question so uh, per se it does not have any uh, direct relation with the pcos but yes <clears throat> some uh, see we will have to understand what is pcos it has got a set of criteria which Uh, has a clinical uh, features out of which obesity is present, hirsutism, or a deal um, <clears throat> the menstrual irregularities, which will uh, compromise. Uh, sorry, which will compromise of the uh, PCOS. Uh, now, <clears throat> when such patients come, if we see any other symptoms like pushing, suppose they may have some clinical manifestations of oral health. Yes. But I would not say PCOS per se would have some oral manifestations. Yes, if they have diabetes because of PCOS, hyperglycemia. Yes, definitely they will again have. So it's a complex thing, which I will not say that just because of PCOS they may have some oral manifestations. But due to other reasons, they will definitely have. Okay. So oral pigmentation is not a primary manifestation of uh, PCOS, but no. secondary to diabetes, which is induced by. Yes, yes, there is a possibility. Okay. So, and uh, some live questions here. I think only two live questions. One is how to deal with burning tongue. Uh, so, burning tongue and this uh, burning mouth syndrome is a very interesting one. So, this this is actually where people try to diagnose. Uh, <clears throat> it on the basis of just clinical features that they have one sensation and they try to rule out all the causes like diabetes hyp- hypothyroid and any other causes now i would say the best is to use uh, the oral gels and uh, local uh, anesthetic applications otherwise there is nothing much uh, we can do and of course yes you can also try, uh, give vitamin b supplements Okay. that helps uh, to an extent so something like benzodiazepine which is an anti inflammatory analgesic anesthetic mouthwash and yes, then yes. vitamin b supplements together to be able to control sure. yes but it takes so, a longer time because uh, what happens is in this burning mouth syndrome uh, we have some uh, set of diseases which have this manifestation but there are a lot of places where it is just manifested without any cause that becomes a bit, uh, bit difficult to treat also okay so that brings us to the last question a 30 year old female patient was uh, patient presented with complaint of gum bleeding of two weeks duration and uh, clinical examination showed that oral hygiene was there but there was bleeding gums on the checkup what are the investigation the same thing which i asked so basically now uh, sorry uh, the age of the patient 30 30 year old 30, female yeah 30 year old female so see any any patient coming with the uh, gum bleeding this first things we'll have to think of hematological why all of a sudden this patient has some issues so hematological work up first we done basic cbc uh, and uh, the platelet count uh, for some time and imr And of course, if you have any suspicion, then retic- reticular set down. Yes, clinical examination a little bit difficult. Maybe for dentist uh, who have been in practice for a long time, heptasplenic megaly, mild jaundice. Then I have hemolytic anemia. So mild jaundice. All these things, clinical examination with correlation and hematological workup first. The second thing, maybe because of vitamin C, uh, <laughs> scurvy. That is one of the things. Yeah, which is. Usually, uh, a very late manifestation of vitamin C, and then um, the rest is again the vitamin D and uh, hyperthyroid. But hyperthyroid basically they don't per se present with a bleeding gum until unless they have a trauma. 
So okay. that is the reason why I mentioned in my uh, implications in uh, treating the hyperthyroid patient that yes, it has to be patient has to be rendered euthyroid so that there is no uh, bleeding because it's a uh, hypervascular state. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Shashi Moli, for this uh, enlightening session. Thank you. And uh, now maybe have uh, Dr. Nilesh Parde, Dr. Priyanka Singh, and Dr. Pradakshna on screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Shashi. It was a uh, beautiful presentation, so elaborate and uh, very nicely presented it in detail. You have covered all our doubts. You have answered all the questions so much in detail, and we really appreciate all your efforts. And uh, despite of uh, not being a dentist, the way you have answered all the, the queries related to dental uh, treatments and doubts, I really appreciate uh, your knowledge about dental field as well. And I really thank you. And uh, may I now call upon Dr. Priyanka to extend the vote of thanks. Uh, I think you're muted, Priyanka. I can't hear you. Dr. Priyanka, please increase your mic volume. Can Dr. Pradakshina do the formalities? Can she extend the vote of thanks? Am I audible, sir? Yeah, don't yeah, yeah. No. Yes. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Also, many congratulations to Dr. Shashi Molly for such an excellent and very informative presentation. We are thankful that you accepted our invitation in such a busy schedule. I also thank Dr. Rajiv Chitkupi for well moderating the session and especially the wonderful question answer round. I thank our sponsor for this event. That is ICPA Mumbai. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind support. I owe my special gratitude to the audience, senior faculty members, clinicians, and all the delegates for your patience and valuable time. The certificates of participation will be emailed to all the delegates on your registered email IDs. Now coming to the end of the session, I thank you all once again. Have a night. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you all. Good night and thank you all for joining. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.